Thanks, Jen. Um, we've been doing this now for four years, and the uh, presentation has grown every year. And I'm always amazed by the amount of the, the, the turnout and the interest that you all have about your disease process. And we as clinicians value that. I think patients do better long term if they are engaged in their healthcare management, understand their disease, understand the uh, indication for therapy, and that improves compliance. And frankly, it makes our job more interesting when you come with questions and are engaged um, in your management. So we appreciate that. I'm going to talk about what's new in HER2 new disease. I don't have a pointer that's going to point at both screens, so you're going to have to just watch visually as I go through the slides here. Let's backtrack. So the topics I'm going to cover are a, an update on the adjuvant Herceptin data. Adjuvant refers to women who have early stage disease that this pertains to women who have HER2 positive disease. We're going to talk about what that means here in a few minutes. And there uh, was data presented in 2005 that really was monumental regarding adjuvant Herceptin, and now I'm going to do a longer term update on that. Then we're going to talk about another trial that looked at is two years of Herceptin better than one year of Herceptin. Those data were presented at San Antonio when we were awaiting uh, update on that trial. Then we're going to talk about the FAR trial, and they went the other direction and said, is six months adequate as compared to a year of Herceptin? So that all relates to early stage breast cancer. After that, we're going to talk about uh, pertusumab or Progetta, which is a different antibody used in HER2 positive disease, and an updated uh, data set that was shown at San Antonio regarding outcomes. And then while not presented at San Antonio, I want to at least touch uh, on TDM1, which is a new drug that should be approved in the very near, near future that patients have been asking about and we've been excited about. So let's get everyone in the audience up to speed. I know that there are people in the audience who can give the talk tonight. There are others who don't even know what HER2 means. So it's a bit challenging sometimes to give a talk where we want to satisfy everyone's interest level. So to bring everyone up to speed, this is a little diagram here that shows I'm going to attempt to maybe point on one. Oh, that didn't work. I don't think I did that. Can we go back? I won't touch anything. I'll let you queue up. <laughs> Okay, so I don't have a pointer, but you can see the blue dot there. Envision that as the HER2 receptor. And half of the receptor sticks out on the outside of the cell, and half of it sticks into the uh, inside of the cell. You can see the red Y, which stands for trastuzumab or Herceptin, which is the antibody. Think of this as a fertilizer pathway that 25% of cancers have. So if the cancer is overexpressed with this fertilizer pathway, we call it HER2 positive breast cancer. If they have that, that is a pathway that can feed cancer cell growth, development, and spread. So we want to block that pathway. One strategy is to block it externally with the treatment trastuzumab or Herceptin, which is an antibody that binds to the external domain of that receptor and shuts that pathway down or attempts to shut it down. Another strategy is to bind the internal domain with a medication that will turn a switch off to minimize that transmission of that growth fertilizer signal. Tonight we're not going to talk about lapatinib, otherwise known as Ticurb. It is an FDA-approved oral agent for HER2-positive breast cancer. That was not a real highlight at San Antonio this year, but um, be aware that that's one additional strategy to block this fertilizer pathway. I also want to point out that in the past we thought it was all about HER2, but now we know that there are several other HER receptors. There's a HER1, a HER2, a HER3, and a HER4. It stands for Human Epidermal Growth Factor Receptor. And again, you can see the family here of receptors. The orange one is the HER2. And as I referenced, if you block that receptor, either externally or internally, you can impact cell growth. I'm going to allude to this in later slides that we now know it's not just as simple as blocking that receptor. These receptors can, can crosstalk and 
uh, communicate to each other, and therefore it may be more complicated than just blocking one receptor at one location. So here is the opening slide of the update from the two large U.S. adjuvant Herceptin trials. The way cancer studies usually work is when a drug is investigated in the advanced stage setting, stage 4 disease, and is effective, then typically they move it into the early stage setting. So that's exactly what happened with Herceptin. Years passed, it was proven to be effective in HER2 positive stage 4 disease, then they brought it into the early stage setting, and the, these data that I'm going to show are the outcomes of those two U.S. trials that looked at Herceptin in the, in the early stage setting. So women who have early stage disease, stage 1, 2, 3, and is HER2 positive. And there were two trials, the NSABP B31 and the 9831 trial, that they combined that data set to report outcomes. So patients eligible for the trial were early stage disease, HER2 positive, Most patients were lymph node positive, but they then amended one of the trials and allowed higher risk lymph node negative patients to also be enrolled. Complicated slide, but let me point out, those of you who have had chemotherapy, you'll understand my language here. Those of you who haven't, just bear with me here. The four blue boxes are standard chemotherapy we use called adriamycin cytoxin. So AC chemotherapy times four cycles. The fuchsia circles are Taxol. So another chemotherapy drug we typically use following AC. So that's standard therapy, AC times four, then Taxol. And notice the bottom um, arms also have yellow dots. That's the Herceptin. So in this data analysis, half the patients did not receive Herceptin, the top arms. The bottom arms all received Herceptin, which was given for a year. And the point of this trial was to evaluate whether Herceptin reduced the, reduced the odds of breast cancer recurrence in early stage patients. These are the prior data from 2005. And on, the, on your left is what we call disease-free survivorship. Who was alive without signs of recurrence? And look at the dramatic difference. 67% in the group that did not receive Herceptin versus 85% in the group that did. These data shocked the oncologic world. This was a huge advancement. It dropped the risk of recurrence by 50%. In oncology, we get excited about changes where we improve outcomes by 10 or 15 or 20%, but 50% was very dramatic. There also was a survival advantage, improved overall survivorship. Again, this was follow-up at um, median follow-up of two years of 87% versus 91%. So not only were we seeing a reduction in the odds of recurrence, but an improvement in survivorship as well. So those are older data from 2005. And this is the, is this the update here? Yes, this is the longer term follow-up, 8.4 years of follow-up. And we see once again with disease-free survivorship, again, who's alive without recurrence, the curves are still separated there is an advantage to taking the Herceptin that is more durable with a longer-term follow-up. Disease-free survival improved from 62% to 73%. And we also see overall survivorship also continues to be um, higher or improved in the group that received the Herceptin. So we now have longer-term follow-up supporting that this drug is impacting long-term outcomes. So the conclusion was, At a follow-up of 8.4 years, the addition of one year of Herceptin following AC Taxol chemotherapy is associated with improved outcomes, improving overall survivorship, reducing the odds of death by 37%, and reducing the risk of recurrence by 40%. Again, huge outcome differences. So we were excited to see that update, but at San Antonio, they also discussed, is one year the optimal duration? We always tell patients this. When the trials were initially developed to analyze Herceptin in the adjuvant setting, there was no data that um, drove the decision about one year. It was a random decision. They said, well, it works in stage four disease. Let's try it in early stage disease. How long should we give it? A year. It was a random decision. So now we have data looking at two years versus one and six months versus one year to say, did we get it right? Okay. So this is a trial out of Europe, the HERA trial, that as one of their arms, they looked at two years versus one year. 
And in this trial, most of the patients uh, were lymph node positive, but actually 32% were lymph node negative, more so than what we saw in the U.S. trials. They had a spectrum. In this trial, they were allowed to pick chemotherapy regimens, but you can see at the bottom, they had typical adriamycin, taxol-based regimens that we saw in the U.S. trials. And I'm going to go through these slides rather quickly because the take-home point is there was no difference between two years versus one year. When you look at uh, disease-free survivorship, look at the lines. They are superimposable. Likewise for overall survivorship, two years versus one year. They did show, and this is an issue that we discussed with patients, that there were higher cardiac rates. Herceptin can cause cardiac, cardiac toxicity, which is why we have to follow patients with echocardiograms every three months when they're on therapy. So with the two years of therapy, we saw higher cardiac events. Um, largely, they were reversible, though. So the take-home point of this data set is that two years is not better than one. And while we saw more cardiac events, it was largely reversible, which is, I think, um, reassuring to those, of those patients who do have a, a drop in their cardiac status while they're on Herceptin. In over 75% of cases, they usually recover that, that difference. So one year two years equivalent, so the standard of care is one year. But then what about the FAR trial? The FAR trial said, do we really need one year? Can we give Herceptin for a lesser duration? And this trial, they looked at six months versus one year. Again, similar patient eligibility. They had to have early stage disease. They did allow patients who were lymph node negative. Uh, They had standard, typical chemotherapy. In this trial, it was four cycles of chemotherapy. And then they were randomized to either six months of Herceptin versus one year. The analysis is kind of complicated. The take home point is it does not appear that six months is equivalent to one year. It was a complicated non-inferiority trial, but then we get into a double negative that was not non-inferior. So the take home point is one year is better than six months. However, in certain subsets, there was a reference that six months may be equivalent, but we need further trials to analyze that and recommend that. So the current standard of care is still one year. I actually saw a patient today, I'm not sure if she's in the audience, but we had this complicated discussion about this data because she had a small tumor, was lymph node negative, had had six months of therapy, and said, can I stop? And I said, well, the standard of care is still one year, but if there is someone who I would advise as possibly it's okay to stop based upon these data, it would be someone like her. But again, the standard of care is still one year. So the conclusion was the FAR trial failed to show that six months of Herceptin is non-inferior to 12 months. In other words, 12 months is superior. So this is back to where I was kind of alluding to this concept of is the HER2 pathway a simple one-way street? Do we have one receptor that if we block it, we can impact communication and cell growth? And we kind of thought it used to be like this. Now we know it's more like this, that it's not just one receptor signaling to the nucleus on a one-way street, but more so it's a complicated network of several receptors that can cross-talk, and then even inside the cell, you can see the green dots and the purple dots. Those are other proteins that can cross-talk and send a signal. So if you block one pathway, you can have a secondary route that can still give the signal to the nucleus to tell the cell to grow. So the more we can understand those cross pathways and alternate routes, we can better block the the fertilizer signal and impact outcomes. So some evolving concepts are simply blocking HER2 may not be optimal. Dual blockade, the concept of blocking on the external domain with with an antibody and internally with a small molecule switch may be optimal compared to single blockade. And that blockade of more than one of the HER receptors may be better than Blocking more than one may be superior to blocking just one site. We call that heterodimerization, where one receptor talks to another receptor. In this picture, you can see, it doesn't project real well, but the the diagram is showing how HER1 can talk to HER1, and HER1 can talk to HER2, and HER3 can talk to HER4, etc. What we know is that what's in the red box there is that when HER2 talks to HER3, that appears to be the most potent combination that sends signaling to the nucleus. So that sounds like a logical strategy to try and block that that particular heterodimer uh, communication. And that leads us to pertuzumab, which does exactly that. It's an antibody 
Unlike Herceptin, which only binds to HER2, pertusimab binds to HER2 and HER3 and blocks that communication between those two receptors, shown in the, in the diagram here. So it sounds biologically sound. If that is the most potent communication combination, why not try to block that, which is exactly what pertusimab, otherwise known as Pergetta, is aimed at doing. So these are data from San Antonio of 2011, the Cleopatra trial that looked at the combination of Pergetta, that antibody that we just showed, in combination with Herceptin. So now we're talking two antibodies in combination with a chemotherapy drug called, Trastus, or called uh, Docetaxel or Taxotir. Now we're talking stage four disease. So now we're shifting to stage four disease, women who have HER2 positive disease that has not been treated yet in the stage four setting, treating them with a chemotherapy drug, Taxotere, with a dual antibody. So here again is a picture showing how the green antibody, pertusimab, can bind to HER2 and HER3, inhibit that combination, and at the same time, treating with trastuzumab, a dual antibody may be more potent than a single antibody blockade. That's the concept. So here we have the schema, which I already kind of went through. Everyone in the trial got taxotier, typical taxane-based chemotherapy drug we use in stage four disease. All patients received Herceptin, so that's kind of a standard combination, a taxane and Herceptin. Half the patients received pertusimab. So now we have a dual antibody with a single antibody chemotherapy backbone. And what this showed, again, these are data from a year ago, is that the progression-free survival was improved from uh, 12.4 months to 18.5 months, or a difference of 6.1 months. This is the biggest difference ever shown in a HER2, in a HER2 positive patient population in the stage four setting, first line therapy. So this is pretty significant outcome difference. And one thing I wanna point out is sometimes patients look at this and say, only a difference of six months. But remember how we now view breast cancer, stage four disease, oftentimes is more like a chronic disease. If you, gain, if you gain, uh, gain six months from one therapy and six months from another therapy and four months, et cetera, it starts to add up. So we get excited about any gains we can make. Also, the overall survival curve showed a trend favoring the dual antibody, but the final analysis a year ago did not show an absolute benefit yet. We needed further follow-up to confirm was there an overall survival advantage. So the conclusion a year ago was that the Cleopatra trial met its primary endpoint, improving progression-free survivorship um, in, uh, from 12.4 months to 18.5 months and a trend towards overall survival advantage. And at the end of San Antonio 2011, this was uh, deemed as being a new regiment that may be practice changing in HER2 positive first line stage four disease. And sure enough, since then, this is difficult to read, but these are the NCCN guidelines. These are guidelines we always refer to as how we should treat patients based upon data. And buried in that algorithm there shows HER2 positive stage four disease, first line therapy, consider the combination of Pergetta, Herceptin, and Taxotere based upon the Cleopatra data. So now we fast forward to San Antonio 2012, and we have further outcomes update on the progression-free survivorship. Again, we see a difference of 12.4 months versus 18.7 months. So we see this durable six-month difference. And now we have uh, mature overall survival data showing an improvement in overall survivorship from 50% to 66%. So that was kind of exciting to show not only do we have a PFS advantage, we have now have an overall survival advantage. The final topic I want to at least um, reference is TDM1. This is a really exciting compound because what it is is targeted chemotherapy. Think of the Herceptin antibody. That goes directly to the HER2 positive cancer cells. So it's more like a targeted therapy. Chemotherapy is not targeted. It goes to any, it, it potentially affects any rapidly dividing cell. But if you can tag, this is one of those interesting concepts. Why don't we think of this sooner? If you can tag a chemotherapy drug to the antibody, allow the complex to circulate in the body, attach to the HER2 receptor on the cancer cell, and then deliver the chemotherapy, then we have a concept of targeted chemotherapy with lesser toxicity. And that's exactly what this does. It is the Herceptin backbone with a chemotherapy drug called DM1 attached to it. And this is how it works. 
the complex, which is the green backbone is the Herceptin, the little yellow is the chemotherapy attached to it. It binds to the HER2 receptor, which is the purple diagram there. The complex then is internalized within a cell. So now we have the chemotherapy delivered directly to the cancer cell, and the chemotherapy is then released inside the cell. And based upon data that were uh, presented and published in the, New, in the New England Journal of Medicine, here are some outcomes that show that when you compare TDM1, targeted chemotherapy concept, to a more traditional approach, which would be, in this trial they chose, oral chemotherapy called Zalota, capecitabine, in combination with Ticurb, lapatinib. That's that oral drug that targets the internal domain of the HER2 receptor I showed you. So that's kind of a standard combination we typically reach for at some point in the disease management. So they compared that standard to TDM1 and showed that there was an improvement in response rates from 30% to 42%, which is great. But on top of that, there was much less toxicity because it's targeted rather than systemic chemotherapy. And the progression-free survival was improved from uh, six months to nine months. And overall survival uh, was 25 months versus 30 months. So again, anytime we can make incremental gains, it can all be sequential and add up. So final slide is... I think second to last slide, review of HER2-directed therapies. I like to show this slide and show the long list because five, six years ago, we had nothing to talk about or very little to talk about. Now we have a very complicated space, which is really exciting. So therapies are her Herceptin, which binds to that external domain of the receptor. It's approved for early stage disease and stage four disease. Lapatinib ticurb, didn't talk about that much tonight, but that's that oral agent that binds that internal domain and turns that switch off. It's approved in stage four disease and is now being investigated in the early stage diseases, in, in the early stage setting as well. Pertusimab or Pergetta, it's that other antibody that binds to HER2 and HER3 that we discussed. Neratinib, didn't really talk about that tonight, but that's another internal switch molecule that binds to more internal switches than just the HER2. There's also a HER3 antibody under further development and investigation, and then TDM1, which we're anticipating FDA approval very soon. So now what do we do? In early stage disease, the standard of care is still Herceptin for a year. We discussed the data from the HERA trial that two years is not better than one, and it appears that one is still better than six months, but we have other short-term data that we need to follow up on. In the metastatic setting, first-line setting, we certainly now consider, or can consider, pertusimab, Herceptin, and Taxotere based upon the data that we discussed tonight. Beyond that, there really is no absolute algorithm. We have a lot of options. We can do the Ticurb zalota combination. We can reintroduce Herceptin with other chemotherapies. So there's not a really defined absolute algorithm. And we kind of talk to the patient about how they're feeling, what side effect profile they're willing to tolerate, uh, what their performance status is. We just kind of try and tailor the best therapy for the, for the patient. And we need to await evolving data and approval incorporating Ticurb in early stage disease, TDM1, and other agents in the advanced stage disease as well as early stage uh, studies that are ongoing. And I show this slide every talk because we always come back from San Antonio thinking we're really smart and then we realize, whoa, we still have a lot more to discover my wife, who's actually in the audience tonight, who's not in medicine, she always says things like, you don't know the answer to that yet? And I say, I know. You'd think we'd know the answer to that, but there are so many gaps we still don't know. So we still are making huge strides, and I love to talk about her too because we made an enormous strides in the last five, five to ten years. But stay tuned. A lot more in development. And I think we're going to do questions at the end. Next speaker is John.